In the last lecture, I discussed carbon cycling, and I specifically focused on organic carbon. Here, we're going to focus on another topic, which is inorganic carbon and its effect on something called pH. Organic and inorganic carbon are similar to the, the differentiation between organic and inorganic nitrogen, and we'll get into that as we move into the lecture. But this lecture is a complementary lecture to the one uh, that comes before it. Here I present this slide again, uh, convincing you that we are in fact moving along quite rapidly through these materials. I'm going to talk about two things today again, nutrients here, and when I say nutrients I mean CO2, and pH, which is intimately related to the amount of CO2 in the water. Again, a quick overview before we begin. I want you to understand explain what pH and hardness mean, so these are two common terms if you don't know them yet. You need to understand how the inorganic carbon cycle is closely linked to stream pH. And I want you to explain why pH has such profound impacts on organisms within streams. Uh, also note, if you haven't seen it before, pH is always uh, symbolized by a lowercase p and a capital H. That is the way that it would be written even if it was at the beginning of a sentence, although it would be unusual to start a sentence with the, with the letters pH. In the background here, what I've provided is a picture of a stream kind of swamp. It is a stream by some technical sense, but it's also very slow flowing and very, very broad. So it starts to break into a group that's not always obvious. Uh, this is sort of a wetted forest area. But in any case, the pH in these environments tends to be relatively low. And the organisms in it, for instance, this beautiful pygmy sunfish, have adapted to live in those relatively low pH environments, and that takes special adaptations to do so. All right, so what we're going to talk about today is the carbon cycle. I'll introduce this slide again when we get back to CO2. Uh, but I want you to understand that CO2, which is atmospheric, is going to dissolve in and out of solution, and that's going to have profound impacts on this thing called pH. The other thing that we're going to need to talk about is the pH scale. And before we get too far into this talk about DIC, what I want to first talk to, to sort of remind you about is that pH comes in a scale measured from 0 to 14. Uh, waters that are neutral sit at 7, so the magical number for neutral water is 7. If you become more alkali or basic, then you go up on the scale, so you go into the 8, 9, 10s, and so forth. If you become more acidic, you go down on the scale. To give you some example, that things like stomach acid can drop the stomach to as low as a pH of 1, uh, but things like, say, black tea may only be at a pH of 5, so acidic, but not extremely so. Compare that to, say, something like seawater, which tends to be basic, but again, not extremely so. All right, so that is the scale and pretty colors and useful sort of pieces on it to remind you where things sit are cool, but what actually is pH? All right, so let's back up a bit then because we need to think about uh, pH and then we'll think about how it relates to dissolved inorganic carbon. Water, which is this strange molecule that we're spending a lot of time in trying to understand, has this unusual principle that it is uh, strongly charged and it is strongly charged such that there's a very strong electrophilic uh, atom that is the oxygen and there are two very small weakly polar atoms that are not able to hold on to their electrons very strongly uh, when they're brought into a bond with oxygen as a result the electrons are actually deformed so although we show this nice picture of this sort of Mickey Mouse look for, uh, for oxygen and hydrogen when they're bound together, they're quite deformed such that the oxygen tends to have electrons around it more frequently than the hydrogen does. That means that on average, the hydrogen has an element of positive charge that is more frequently exposed and the oxygen tends to have an element of negative charge that is more frequent. And that allows you to form these temporary connections which we call hydrogen bonds. Hydrogen bonds are a bond between hydrogen and some other electrostatic, electronegative charge uh, uh, molecule. In this case, it would be the oxygen. Understand that these are extremely temporary. You're talking about easily less than a second, and they happen constantly. That is really important for many of the features that we see with water, including things like the reason that when water freezes, it actually becomes less dense than liquid water, right? That's a fairly unusual feature. When you think of a solid being less dense than a liquid, that's very uncommon. 
But what would happen if instead of that temporary bond being temporary, that bond lasted just a bit too long? Now in this image, uh, this particular picture shows you something that is not really true. Again, these are models and all models are wrong. This one shows a hydrogen bond that's occurring right in the middle of the oxygen. That is not true. Uh, it generally occurs out to the opposite side of the hydrogen, so you would tend to get hydrogen bonds here. When that occurs and they last just a bit too long, maybe the oxygen on the other molecule pulls away too fast and the hydrogen stays too close, and then you, re you get a situation like this one over here where you now have two fully charged molecules floating around in solution, one with a positive charge and one with a negative charge. So the total charge of the solution is zero, but the actual charge on the molecule is now full or a partial charge. One of them is H3O, that's hydronium, hi, sorry, hydronium, and the other one is hydroxide, uh, which is OH negative. OH negative will make the solution, if you have more hydroxide than hydronium, then you'll get a basic solution. If you have more of H3O plus, then you'll have a more acidic solution. Okay, so I've told you a lot about how that actually might occur, but I still haven't told you what pH is, right? So just tell me what it is. And the reason I've been avoiding that is because it's a little bit of an unusual scale, and I wanted to first convince you that the mechanism for producing acidic and basic solutions exists. But what it actually is, is a strange equation right here. And that strange equation is that pH is equal to the opposite of the log of the concentration of hydronium ions in solution. So this is seems very unusual and backwards to think about, but it's just, again, it's a simple scale and it provides a simple numerical way to keep track of things, right? We can use whole numbers instead of dealing with 10 to the negative fifth uh, moles per liter or 10 to the negative two, right? We can just deal with one, two, seven, whatever it is in that case. You can think about it like this, right? You can think about 10 to the negative pH. That's another way to think about it. But that's, again, that's an awkward way to think about it. So we like to just use whole numbers that are positive because we're biased and we're simple, right? We like simple whole large numbers. To be clear, even at a pH of seven, there are ions floating around. Water is constantly pulling itself apart and then recombining. If a hydronium ion and a hydroxide ion bump into each other, they'll reform two water molecules, which will go on for some period of time and pull apart again. If, on the other hand, you add an acid to a solution, what you're actually going to do is create a lot of hydronium ions that do not have a paired hydroxide, and so the solution will become more acidic. If you, for instance, add a bunch of hydroxide ions that have no hydronium, then you will produce a bunch of uh, hydroxide ions that have no component of a positive charge, and so the solution become more basic. It's also important to note that you could report pOH, right? I don't know that anyone does that regularly. I don't think I've ever seen it before, but it's just by convention we report pH, so relative to how acidic the solution is, okay? And to give you some example of what natural systems look like, this chart isn't perfect. Again, all things are, all models are wrong, some are useful, but it does give you a good idea. Many streams will fall into this more neutral range, maybe into the five to eight region. If you go and buy aquatic organisms at a fish store, the vast majority of fish that you may buy will probably easily live between five to eight. Now that's a huge difference because each one of these is an order of magnitude jump. So the difference between let's say five and eight is three orders of, of magnitude, right? Five to six is one, six to seven is another, and then seven to eight is a third. And that means that it's 10 times 10 times 10. So it's a thousand times different in concentration, which is a lot, right? So that's the difference between someone saying, I'm walking, I'm riding on the highway, I'm in a space shuttle, but five to eight uh, is not a huge range. Some systems may get as high as nine, that would be unusual, but it does occur. Uh, and very rarely do we see extremes outside of that. Five is a pretty low mark. If you go out and just measure the pH in your local stream, I suspect you will find it's probably in the upper sixes to the, the mid sevens. So maybe one pH unit. As a result, when you look at this, right, this is this is a little bit less generous than it should be. It says here streams are maybe six, five to six to maybe somewhere seven, almost eight. Fish live outside, even uh, in broader ranges than that what's listed here. Precipitation tends to be slightly negative. This thing that we'll talk about, which is called acid rain, uh, comes out at a very, very negative rate. 
It's also worth noting that when there is thing, there are things like acid rain, uh, fish will die as a result of that, and not just fish, but a lot of organisms. Crabs, snails, mussels, things that rely on calcium especially to build shells will have a hard time building shells when the pH falls below neutral. Okay, and this is unfair. This is what's showing you is the pH ranges that we find in the human body, not the pH ranges that humans could, let's say, live in. pHs that humans live in are, are basically unmeasurable because humans live in uh, air and there isn't a pH to air, so that doesn't really make sense. But we do find a range of pHs in the human body. And you can see that seawater here is even uh, more narrow than, say, streams, uh, and that blood is located somewhere in close to neutral. But it actually does vary uh, depending on how fast you're breathing. All right, so again, returning to this picture that we showed before, what we need to talk about today is the inorganic carbon. And the inorganic carbon is really, for us anyway, CO2 and this thing called DIC, which is dissolved inorganic carbon, which is helpful. Technically, things like methane would also fall into inorganic carbon, but the majority of the time, we're just gonna talk about CO2 as being inorganic. And again, the reason that we classify these things as organic or inorganic is simply the complexity of these molecules. Simple inorganic molecules can be made by inorganic processes. For instance, methane and CO2 can both be produced with or without living organisms. However, organic molecules largely require uh, life to actually produce those. So let's look at uh, DIC here. Again, this is tightly linked to CO2. All right, so we've talked about pH now. I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, oh, we're gonna talk about the carbon cycle. I showed you the carbon cycle. I promised the carbon cycle. So let's go look at the carbon cycle. Carbon actually can react with water, okay? And it's a very simple reaction. You can see it here. CO2 gas in the atmosphere can combine with water and make H2CO3, literally one water added to a CO2. And if it so happens that that is created, it may kick off a hydrogen, right? And when it does that, it will, become, it will make an acid, right? Because it is entering a solution that has some equal charge let's say, and it is kicking out a negatively charged hydrogen ion. This negatively charged molecule over here is not going to alter pH, right? That negatively charged molecule is indirectly altering pH by releasing this hydrogen, which is what we're actually measuring when we do pH stuff. You can even go a little bit further and you can kick off another hydrogen and become this molecule down here. It's very rare, um, but it does occur occasionally in waters. Conversely, a lot of rocks and sediments are made of calcium carbonate, and that can go into solution. Then calcium can be released. And when this, this charged molecule is in solution here, what it will actually do is recombine with water, and it produces hydroxide. And that hydroxide will either react with one of those little H pluses floating around, or uh, it will stay in solution and not have anything to react to, and that will make the solution more basic. So CO2 will push the reaction towards more acidic. Calcium carbonate, which is a white rock that is very common in a lot of areas, will push it towards a more basic solution. I'm sorry, did I say CO2 will push it towards a more acidic? Calcium carbonate will push it towards a more basic solution. This, as a result, means that uh, CO2 is really important for changing the pH of the aquatic system, even in low concentration. In addition to that, think about it this way. What other things contribute CO2, a dissolved inorganic carbon, uh, in a sense, to the aquatic system? And a hint, it's in this image right here. It's both animals, right? Animals are constantly contributing CO2, and plants. And conversely, plants are removing CO2 from the aquatic system. So at night, plants are constantly producing CO2. They have to a, have a metabolism and they are therefore lowering pH with animals in the same, same environment. But during the day, plants are reversing, right? So they are making lots of O2 and consuming CO2, and therefore pH should increase during the day. So that means that in a very simple world, in one sense, animals push towards the negatives and plants push towards these, uh, I should say, animals push towards the acidic side and plants push towards the basic side. Again, 
assuming that plants get light during the day, they will generally push in the direction of basic. If something were to happen and a lot of plants were suddenly to die or they didn't have access to sunlight, then they would push in the direction the animals are pushing, which is they'll make solutions more and more acidic by releasing more and more CO2. And it should also not surprise you then that climate change is going to have a profound impact on the way these systems operate, in part because it's going to push CO2 uh, into the water. Now you can actually see this effect so one thing that I've done here is there's a really large group of plants that grow up here at what's called the Susquehanna Flats. Let me highlight that up here at the very head of the Chesapeake Bay. And that very large group of plants actually changes the water noticeably, the pH of that water very noticeably. So let me get a black marker here. During March, here this first one, you can see that the river plume, which is located right here, flows down it sort of cascades down the side of the uh of, of the drop off that is a susquehanna river and it comes in pretty close to neutral 7.2 7.4 maybe right dic at the same time which is dissolved inorganic carbon is low there but you can see it's pretty constant all throughout the water column now march is a relatively slow period for plants it's a period where plants are starting to, to to kick back up right they're just coming out of winter at this point and there aren't that many conversely look at what happens in april right all of a sudden plants are growing all over the place and now the ph skyrockets right it goes from that 7.2 to that 8.2 so the the plants themselves create an enormous amount of pH shift. They create an order of magnitude shift in the pH right in that localized area. In addition to that, you can actually see that those purple colors disappear, right? Because the, the um, in addition to that, the plants are pulling uh, CO2 out of the water, right? And so they're, they're having profound impacts. This wedge right here is different than all of the other water because the, the plants are depleting all of that CO2 from the water column. And then as we get full on into the growing season here in May, you can still see that pH shift because of the plants, right? It's very, very noticeable. And the, the uh, DIC is hugely depleted, right, relative to the water column. Look at all the purple is contained right here. And if you were just to guess from this little segment over here, you would anticipate that it would be green or light blue. But in fact, the, the plants have pulled all the CO2 out of the water because they're so rapidly photosynthesizing. So a really good example of plants actually going about and modifying the flow and the, the chemical properties of the water that are passing them. And this can occur in streams, right? Streams are uh, maybe less prone to this, this kind of thing, although the Susquehanna Flats is right at the interface between what we'd consider an estuary and a, and a river, uh, but they can have profound impacts on things like the pH. And if you are studying limnology broadly and you look at lakes, you will see that very, very rapidly. All right, and this is what the Susquehanna Flats look like. You can see that th this is, first of all, this is a very large river, right? So I, I don't want you to think, oh, this is a little tiny thing, right? This is a river so large that were you to say, I'll just swim across it, right? Just a river, I'll just swim across it. You would probably get tired before you reach the other side uh, and you would need to have somebody help you, right? Get back onto a boat and wait until you had recovered. You can see that the plants go on and on and on and on, and you can see the density of those plants, right? These are huge, hugely abundant uh, beds of, of uh, what are called seagrass or eelgrass, uh, but our vallicinaria is the, is the genus. Also, this person is doing a wonderful do job wearing their PFD. Always remember, whenever you're in the water, wear a PFD, saves lives. This person does not have their PFD uh, buckled. Uh, please make sure that when you have a PFD on, it is buckled. It does not help you if you go overboard and it's not buckled, it will come right off. One of the other things to think about too here is this thing called buffers. So we've talked about acids and bases now. And acids and bases are the addition of those H plus or those OH negative ions. But when there are salts floating around in solution, so take a look at the right, those HCO3 negative ions, they will actually occasionally pick up H pluses, right? Uh, or the sodium can pick up a Cl or a, 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 a CO3 negative, or it can um, uh, it can combine with an OH negative, and that regular combining, recombining uh, with these solutions in these solutions, I should say, means that these solutions change pH more slowly 
because free ions have a harder time making large shifts, right? They are more evenly balanced by the charges that are in the water. And that means that you can slow pH change, that these inorganic salts floating around will slow the pH change in solutions. And in fact, you can buy uh, these buffers and get very close to these pHs for long periods of time. So when you buy buffers like proper pH 6.5, it will in fact keep your aquarium very close to pH 6.5 especially if you add it in the right dosage. If you add a very small amount, it won't help you, but it's a salt that will help to buffer that thing around 6.5. As the pH becomes more acidic, it will tend to release negatively charged ions that will combine with those H pluses and control the pH drop. As it becomes more basic, it will tend to release H plus ions uh, that, will, that will push it uh, slowly, more slowly towards that, right? So it will, it will slow down shifts in one direction or the other. And these are natural. They occur all throughout uh, nature. There are lots of different salts that buffer solutions. And uh, many streams and waterways have their pH buffered so that radical shifts in say a moment by moment or a day to day aren't common, but over the course of maybe a growing season, they might change uh, as a result of these kind of things. So pH is a, remember is a logarithmic scale. So these things are very large, but the pH balance uh, tends to be relatively uh, steady through time in part because of things like buffers. All right, and just to convince you that there are in fact these differences across spatial scales, here's some an example of that, right? So this is uh, pHs of waters measured around the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. You can see that in some areas it tends to be very low indeed, but in other areas it tends to be pretty moderate, right? And there are large differences even in relatively short, say, miles of habitat, right? That's not that big a difference in area. But regions tend to be very similar to one another. So organisms in a region will probably experience similar conditions. Now, one of the things that I mentioned earlier is this thing called acid rain. And acid rain, it turns out, is really important. And what people don't necessarily know is that we still have acid rain and that acid rain is in fact uh, very uh, treatable. Uh, it's caused by humans, but the, the way in which it occurs and how to affect it are well known. So we could actually reduce it very easily if we wanted to. Rainwater tends to be slightly acidic. So it tends to be right around six, which is a little bit more acidic than uh, neutral water at about seven. That's because as it passes through the air, it's picking up lots of CO2. That CO2 is making an acid. And so it tends to be slightly acidic as a result of that. But if you look at the northeast of the United States, this is a great map of that, you'll see that the pHs are quite a bit lower than that. Some as low as four and a half, uh, and they were lower uh, at even uh, prior, this is from 2008, prior to 2008. And you can see, interestingly, that they are concentrated in sort of Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, West Virginia area. And if you know anything about that area, you will know why that's the case. Acid rain is created in the same way that other rain is created. It's rain that just falls through the air. But when we burn things like coal, um, uh, uh, we get a lot of nitrogen and sulfur gases out into the atmosphere. And it turns out just like CO2, NO2 and SO2 are very happy to combine with water. And when they go about doing that, they make acids. And when they make acids, they make the rain more acidic. Okay, so that, for, it's the same process, we're just adding more of these uh, inorganic molecules into the atmosphere. As a result of that, the pH that's coming out of the rain is much lower. That lower pH has profound impacts on the ecosystems, not least of which is it can deplete those buffers that buffer the waters. And that, that can change the pH of streams by first filtering through the water. Often it will do things like kill trees, which are also sensitive to, to pH levels. Now the Clean Air Act in the 70s uh, brought this concern to the front because it, you could sue to, to have the government protect air quality. But actually it wasn't fully addressed until the 90s, or I should say addressed until the 90s, when Canada and the US agreed that they would limit production of these nitrogen and sulfur gases from power plants. And it turns out that that's the majority of where it occurs uh, and as a uh, car exhaust as well as the other one, but is also well controlled. Hence the reason you have a catalytic converter on your car, which is that thing that sticks off the back of your car that looks sort of like a box, right, as the, the gas is about to exit uh, the tailpipe. 
Now the uh, power plants need to have a similar thing. They have what are called scrubbers that are on their smokestacks, which help eliminate these releases of NO2 and SO2 out into the environment. And if we were good about requiring them to have them and update them regularly, then we would have very tight control of the release of these gases. However, because of the way in which uh, environmental regulations have become a political football and part of the culture wars, there's a clear divide between political parties in the U.S. to respond to this, even though uh, it would be help beneficial to all people in the U.S., right? It would reduce a number of issues that are associated with acid rain. And if you're interested, go ahead and, and look up acid rain to see what the, those, those damages are. But again, because this has fallen into the culture wars, the appetite to respond has largely divided along partisan lines. And so we don't see good response uh, in, the, in the way that we should for the protection of our of our landscape, unfortunately. So acid rain is an immediately solvable problem, but people have been slow to respond to it. So who cares about acid rain, right? This is another chemical feature of the landscape. There are a number of issues or human health problems associated with it. Again, if you're interested, I would look it up uh, exactly what those are, because there's lots of them to, to discuss. It actually, the other thing it does is it helps dissolve buildings, right? Acidic substances coming in contact with things like rocks, and a lot of rocks are made of calcium carbonate, will dissolve away, okay? It does a lot of damage to forests. It releases aluminum, actually, it turns out, into the water column. We're not going to talk about the aluminum cycle, but it turns out that aluminum is important in streams and waterways, and that the release of aluminum, especially into forested regions, causes wide-scale plant loss. And it kills animals directly. As I warned you before, pHs have profound impacts on the way that organisms live in them, and pHs that fall too far are impossible for organisms to live in. Now, we have partially addressed acid rain, and unsurprisingly, uh, maybe, organisms have responded very favorably to that. So, for instance, this is dated from 2019, uh, and you can see that uh, acid rain at one point had eliminated all fish from this lake, and you can see now that that is quite a beautiful brook trout. Um, and so with some control, even without perfect control, uh, organisms are responding very positively to it. So if we did a better job, we would probably get systems back to where they were before given enough time. Uh, it's just a matter of having the political appetite to do so. Now, there are organisms that are specially adapted to live in low pH environments. Low pH environments have a couple of issues associated with them. Low pHs mean that there are a lot of ions floating around in the water themselves. And those low pHs, or I should say also basic, uh, if you go into to alkaline waters as well, there are lots of ions floating around that can damage body surfaces because those ions are happy to react with things. Uh, that helps to eliminate that, that charge in the water column. In addition to that, many metabolic processes rely on very tight control of pH. So for instance, the stomach needs to have a pH of a very low level uh, to make sure that it can go about doing its work of pre-digesting food and getting amino acids ready to be consumed or taken up by the small intestine. If the pH is not low enough, the stomach will not function properly and you'll have issues with parasites uh, and with uh, uh, extraction of amino acids from your food. Okay, so that is just one example, and that occurs all throughout the body. If the pH isn't at a certain level, blood doesn't operate very effectively. It goes on and on. So organisms that live in pHs that are vastly different uh, than, the, or, than the, the material that's in their body have to work very hard to both control the pH in their body. So they'll need lots of buffers, and they'll also need very strict sort of separation of fluids in their bodies from the outside environment. And they will also have to spend a lot of energy paying to repair systems that get damaged by these ions. If, for instance, fish or other organisms, because there are plenty of other organisms, enter a low pH environment or high pH environment, environment very different from what they normally live in, they will frequently increase things like mucus or increase the thickness of some boundary layer between them and the water initially. And that will get them through those pH environments. That helps to limit the damage that those ions do, but it's going to cause issues, not least of which, for instance, for fish, if they increase the mucus, they're going to severely limit their DO uptake. So if you're in a pH stressed environment, you're also going to be very vulnerable to low DO. So if you can imagine those little hot pools uh, that get cut off from the rest of the stream are going to be really difficult to live in. 
They're going to have lots of bacteria go into town and making tons of CO2. They are going, as a result of that, they're going to have a low pH. They're going to have low DO because the water's hot and the bacteria are working, right? And they may have uh, all sorts of issues with things like suspended sediments in the water that are going to clog gill surfaces. Okay, so those tend to be very difficult places for organisms to live, uh, and as a result, organisms that can live in it are well adapted to those kind of conditions. So for instance, that mud minnow that I mentioned a little while ago uh, is a good example of an organism that has adapted to live in those extremely difficult environments. The other solutions you can have to low pH or different pH, I should say, is you can leave those systems. You can do things like reduce your metabolic rate, right? So if systems are being damaged, maybe the solution is to slow everything down so that damage can be repaired uh, without it doing uh, permanent damage to the system. The other thing that you can do is you can change the concentration of ions within your own body, right? And you can do that by things like a sodium potassium pump so that ions in your own body uh, change the, the charge in your cells, which will help limit things like the entrance or exit of certain charged molecules. So for instance, if you make yourself very positively charged inside your cells, that will help to limit the entrance of those H plus ions that could damage other materials. That will come at the cost that things like nerve cells rely very heavily on very careful balance of sodium and potassium in and around themselves. So you may have limitations on where you could do that. No matter what pathway you adopt, and no matter what systems you modify, there is going to be a cost to living outside these pH ranges that you normally live in, uh, and that living in these very, very different pHs uh, will cause issues. On the right is a fish that specialized to live in very low pHs. So this is a dace that lives in pH that's around 3.5 and could maybe get even a little bit lower than that. So that's really amazing that this fish can live at what is effectively um, starting to be stomach acid. And you would say, well, what, that must be extremely costly for the fish. Indeed, it must be. Uh, but the advantage is there's no other fish that live in that environment. So this fish, when it's in the wild, is got the whole suite of resources that are available in that low pH environment to its own. But you would anticipate that putting it into an environment where the pH is far more moderate, it would lose out to a lot of other fish because it's going to pay huge costs to maintain uh, bodies that can survive those kind of pHs. All right, the last thing that we need to cover in this lecture is this thing called water hardness. You may hear this occasionally. Hardness is really the amount of calcium and magnesium in the water, just those two ions. And calcium and magnesium are really, really important and really, really common, which is why they're chosen. When water hardness is low, there's very few of these uh, salts in the water. When water hardness is very, very high, there's tons of salt. and the way that you can easily tell if your water is hard or not uh, is to dry out some of the, put let's say a big glass of water out and let it dry out. And if you get a nice white flaky material and a lot of it, then you have relatively hard water. If you get a relatively clear glass, that would tend to suggest that you have very little uh, of the calcium and magnesium ions in solution, so very few salts, right? That's exactly what's drying out of solution. For us uh, here in Maryland, uh, we tend to have very, very soft water, right? And uh, as a result, when we wash dishes, we get uh, nice clear dishes. But if you go into regions that have very, very hard water, uh, I came from a region recently that had very hard water, you often get cloudy dishes. And that's because there's so many salts in the water that they actually just precipitate out while the dishes are being washed and they end up on the surface. And there are ti little tiny salts but there are so many salts in solution in the water, they won't re-dissolve, right? So it's actually, you have to get something like DI water to pull those salts out of solution. Hard water actually often feels soapy uh, you, in your hands, like it actually feels a little bit soapy, but salt, soft water can make the water feel soapy if you add soap to it, right? You put soap on your hands and you wash and you wash and you wash, and you go, wow, this soap doesn't dissolve. There's not much in the water, why is that occurring? Well, it takes, it turns out that those salts help the soap dissolve into it and without them uh, the soap takes much much longer so here in Maryland it takes me much longer which is fine now in the case of a pandemic to wash my hands or at least to feel so as opposed to where I came from in New York where I could stick my hands under the water and the soap would dissolve almost immediately um, from my hands
All right, so next up, what we're going to do is talk about riparian processes. So I'm going to return to some of the ways that streams are physically formed uh, now that we've talked a bit about the chemistry and we have some more background about uh, the, the processes that guide streams in general. 